Okay, uh, we'll get started now. So thank you all for joining. Uh, my name is Kyle Hoffman. I'm the Applications Manager at BSI. And today we're going to be focusing on uh, some methods we've been developing in our lab uh, for glycoproteomics and uh, more specifically uh, the different instrument methods we have tried that have helped improve glycopeptide identification. Okay, so just a brief uh, overview of glycoprotein biosynthesis and glycoproteomics. So um, cells synthesize a wide assortment of glycoproteins uh, in which different amino acids can be modified to contain uh, specific glycan structures. And biosynthesis of such glycoproteins is initiated uh, in the secretory pathway that comprises the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus of cells and can lead to uh, membrane localization or secretion of these glycoproteins. In addition, uh, we can have O and acetyl glucosamine uh, can be added to proteins in the cytoplasm, nucleus, and even the mitochondria. And this single residue is not extended, but can be reversibly added and removed. Um, so the first group of glycans that I'm going to be discussing is N-link glycans. So they are attached to asparagine residues at uh, specific motifs within a protein sequence. And so in contrast to proteins and nucleic acids, which are uh, synthesized by a template-based process, um, glycans are carbohydrates that are have rather complex uh, characteristics uh, in terms of their composition and structure. Uh, so N-link glycans share a common core structure. They have this trimenosyl core. Um, but can be categorized in a few different types of groups and are often highly branched. And so this group uh, shown here is known as high mannose. Here we have a group known as complex uh, and then glycans and uh, hybrid uh, between the two. And then there's even uh, other groups that get even more complex. This one has been referred to as poly N acetolactosamine type. Um, in contrast from N-link, O-link glycans are attached to serine and threonine residues and can contain more than one core structure, uh, which can be elongated either by beta-linked galactose or glucosamine uh, monomers. So what is uh, glycoproteomics? So glycoproteomics aims to determine the positions and identities of the complete repertoire of glycans uh, on glycosylated proteins in a given cellular tissue. And mass spectrometry based approach has allowed large scale uh, global analysis of glycoproteins. However, the structural diversity of glycans and their heterogeneous nature of, uh, in terms of the glycosylation sites make, it, uh, comprehensive, make the comprehensive analysis particularly challenging. Um, and furthermore, glycans can obstruct the complete fragmentation of the peptide backbone. And traditionally, they have been removed for simplicity, but at the cost of losing the information of where the glycan is uh, localizes to. Uh, the MS spectra tend to be more complicated due to the presence of different isomers um, and lots of uh, many different glycan fragmentation ions. And some and have previously been required manual interpretation. Uh, and lastly, database searching for spectral matches can quickly become a combinatorial problem with very large search spaces. Uh, so this requires new innovative uh, software solutions. So this is the reason why we've developed Glycan Finder. So Glycan Finder is a software for glycoproteomics. Um, it's a, it takes a glycopeptide-based approach for both N-linked and O-linked glycosylation. Um, we can identify the site of glycosylation 
uh, using and give confidence to the user that it's the correct site using this uh, A score value. And we can do positional glycan profiling, which I'll get to a little later. <clears throat> uh, glycan finder does accurate glycopeptide detection, can use 4D precursor feature detection, and supports common glycopeptide fragmentation methods, methods such as HCD, ETHCD, and, and CID. And lastly, uh, can perform label-free quantification if you're interested in comparing uh, the abundance of glycopeptides across different samples. Okay, so here is uh, the general workflow of how glycan finder processes raw data. So starting from uh, the raw data, the MS1 uh, and their associated features are extracted, and then these can be used later on for match between runs um, in order to do ID transfer and things like that. Um, the MSMS data initially goes through a spectrum classifier, which determines whether it's a native peptide or otherwise known as non-glycopeptide, or if it contains uh, fragmentation ions that would indicate it's a glycopeptide, these will get sent to the glycan finder search. All non-glycopeptide MS2 uh, spectra undergo a typical protein database search, and the database can be specified by the user. And then um, after the database search, we'll have a list of candidate proteins, uh, which are then fed into the glycan finder search in order to map uh, glycopeptides to proteins. And um, during the glycan finder search, a glycan database is used um, to uh, match the glycan spectra to a particular uh, glycan. And then the result is a list of glycopeptides along with their associated glycoproteins. And any unidentified uh, MS2s, um, we have an option built into Glycan Finder for glycan uh, de novo sequencing. And we have um, a separate list we call the partial tab, where it can contain either a low scoring peptide that has a high, higher scoring um, uh, glycan associated with it, or vice versa, where it has low scoring glycan, uh, but we have a good peptide sequence. Um, so we provide that to the user as well. Okay, so now we'll get into uh, some of the instrument methods we've tested in our lab and um, go through our sample processing as well. So to begin with, we chose uh, to sort of start simple, which is one particular protein. So we chose to use the NIST monoclonal antibody, started with 250 nanograms. Um, so we prepared an intact sample for LCMS analysis, uh, where we deconvolute the data to identify different protein glycoforms. And then um, another uh, NIST sample is used, first denatured, reduced, alkylated, and digested with trypsin for LC-MS-MS analysis. And then with this raw data, we've run it either on our Thermo Lumos instrument or a Timstoff Pro. And so with the Lumos, we tried two different fragmentation types, HCD and ETHCD. And with our Timstoff, we use uh, CID with NanoBoost. Um, and we've uh, kind of played around with different instrument settings in terms of passive ramp cycles um, and target intensity thresholds. So here are the MS uh, analysis parameters that were used either for our Orbitrap or Timstoff Pro. So the precursor ion error tolerances are shown here. Fragment ion error tolerances for each instrument. Um, the glycan fragment ion error tolerance is 20 ppm for each. Uh, we include only peptides that pass a 1% uh, peptide and glycan FDR. Uh, fixed PTMs are 
we used carbamidal methylation since samples were reduced and alkylated. And then variable PTMs are oxidation of methionine, deamidation of sparagine and glutamine. And then the fragmentation types for LUMOS, as I mentioned, HCD, ET, HCD, and CID for Timstoff. And we searched a protein database. Uh, the mouse uniprot proteome was downloaded and the NIST antibody sequence was added to that. So the first uh, method we tested on our LUMOS instrument was the ETHCD method. Um, so as part of this method, we use um, first round of HCD, um, and then we use a target mass trigger. If, if we identify any fragmentation ions um, that correspond to these glycan oxonium ions or oxonium ion fragments, these precursors will then get sent for ETHCD um, fragmentation with a collision energy of 25%. Next, we used a uh, just a straight HCD method, and we used three different uh, sort of the stepping uh, stepping collision energy of 20, 30, and 40 percent for each of the precursor ions. For our Timstoff Pro, the first method we tested, uh, we used a longer ramp time. Um, in hopes to separate out the glycopeptides by ion mobility better. And then we, we use 10 ramps per passive, 10 passive ramps per duty cycle with the maximum target intensity for uh, improving the spectrum quality. Oops, and we use the collision energy shown here. The second Timsoft method we've tried um, has a more regular ramp time of 100 milliseconds with six passive ramps per cycle. And so the shorter cycle time ultimately leads to higher sampling rate. And then a target intensity of 40,000. And the last method we've tried is um, a previously published method using the Timstoff Pro to isolate glycopeptides. And so in this paper, they show that the Timstoff Pro is capable of physically separating um, N-glycopeptides from non-glycopeptides and producing high-quality fragmentation spectra. Uh, so the, the larger glycan moieties um, uh, yield a clear like cluster in the mobilogram as shown here where the, the red dots are glycopeptides and the gray dots represent just native non-glycopeptides. And so by just selecting these precursors in this area of the mobilogram, you can selective, uh, selectively filter out a lot of um, non-glycopeptides, which will ultimately result in better spectral quality of the glycopeptides. And here's the uh, Timsoft method for the instrument settings, regular ramp rate of 100 milliseconds, 10 passive ramps per cycle. And they also in the paper optimized the target intensity uh, shown here. Okay, so initially we did LCMS analysis uh, to identify the major glycoforms. So shown here is the heavy chain. So, um, for the NIST monoclonal antibody, only the heavy chain is glycosylated at one particular site in the constant region. And so uh, here's shown peaks that correspond to the mass of the heavy chain associated with uh, these glycans shown here. And so we can match a number of peaks uh, with these glycans. So here we're showing the glycan compositions for each associated with the heavy chain. So here's the peptide mapping that results from uh, the NIST ETHCD data from LUMOS. And so all the blue bars represent non-glycopeptides and bars in pink are glycopeptides. So as you can see, we've identified six different glycopeptides that map to the 
conserved glycosylation site in the antibody heavy chain uh, constant region. Uh, the HCD method didn't perform quite as well. So you can see we've only found three glycopeptides that map to the same site. Uh, we think this is, well, we get the same coverage of non-glycopeptides. Uh, so HCD is more, I guess, uh, better at fragmenting the peptide backbone rather than producing uh, glycan fragmentation ions. Um, so here's the positional profiling data at that asparagine residue in the heavy chain. As you can see, uh, the three most abundant uh, glycans are identified in each of the samples, whereas the ETHCD method revealed uh, two additional um, glycans from the raw data. And highlighted in red are the uh, glycans identified from the peptide digest with each method that also match to an intact mass. So four of them for the ETHCD and only two from the HCD method. So those are shown here on the LCMS spectra where um, anything with a green star above it indicates that it was identified in the ETHCD uh, MS2 data. And with the red star, it was identified from the HCD data. Here's what a uh, typical glycopeptide spectra looks like within glycan finder. So in the lower M over Z range for the ETHCD data, we see a series of Z, C and Z ions um, that support the sequence the peptide sequence shown above. And then in the higher M over Z range, we see more um, glycan fragmentation ions and the um, glycan structures for each are annotated above each peak. Here's the HCD data. Again, HCD worked very well with fragmenting the peptide backbone and we have a nice B and Y ion series supporting this peptide sequence. And um, in this case, a more abundant glycan within the sample. It does do a fairly good job at fragmenting the glycan as well. Okay, so getting into the results from the three different Timstoff methods. So from the method one that I described earlier, you can see that we've identified uh, significantly more peptides compared to either of the LUMOS methods. And we further increased the number of glycan identifications with the TIMSTOF2 method. And we think this just comes down to having a higher sampling rate and, and being able to identify some of the uh, lower level glycopeptides. Uh, the, the polygon uh, filter method didn't perform quite as well as we were hoping it would be, it would. Uh, nonetheless, it's still. Um, identifies more than, than either of the, the two methods we tried on the LUMOS. And shown here are um, outlined in red are all of the glycans identified from each method that also match to a glycoform at the intact level. And so Timstoff method two uh, performs the best out of any instrument method we've tried. So we even, uh, so we identify a total of six uh, glycans in the MS2 data that, that match to major glycoforms at the intact mass level. And that's highlighted by the green stars for the Timstoff method two. Uh, here's the positional profiling data at that site for each of the methods. You can see the majority of the most abundant glycans also matched the most abundant peaks at the intact mass level. Um, one thing that we notice differs between samples is uh, this particular glycan uh, shown in brown. It seems to be more abundant in the last two Timstoff methods and less abundant in the first one. And we're really not quite sure why this is. And furthermore, we 
we haven't been able to detect it at the intact level. So we're still kind of uh, further investigating that. Uh, next, we tested how much sample is required uh, to identify each of the glycans. So as I mentioned before, we started with 250 nanograms, but we've had some service requests where customers have very limited amount of sample. And so we wanted to test the lower limit and started with 50 nanograms and going up to 500 nanograms. Um, in general, you do lose some identifications when you go down to 50 nanograms. Uh, in some cases, you'll have a PSM without an associated feature or abundance value if you go down to the lower, lower limits. Uh, but in general, we find that 250 to 500 nanograms is the optimal amount of starting material you'll need uh, to identify uh, most glycans. Okay, so that was all done with just one purified monoclonal antibody. So now we're getting into testing more complex samples. Uh, we started a pilot project with this CD33 protein, which was purchased from two different companies, R&D Systems and Sino Biological. Um, so these CD33 was expressed in different host systems um, from R&D, it was expressed in CHO, and from Sinobiological, it was expressed in HEC-293 cells. So in addition to trying to identify, uh, so this is a known glycoprotein uh, that contains a number of different glycosites. Um, and we were also interested in finding what the differences are in, in uh, glycosylations of this protein between the two different preps uh, since they're coming from different host uh, expression systems. So yeah, here's the general protocol. Uh, there's nothing really special about the sample prep procedure here. We just do a standard reduction alkylation, digestion, C18 cleanup, and then inject on our Timsoft Pro using uh, our method number two. So here's what the peptide mapping looks like of CD33 from R&D systems. You can see it's very highly glycosylated. So all the purple bars represent glycopeptides and blue is non-glycopeptides. And we identified six different glycosylation sites across the protein. Two of them are directly adjacent to each other. And it was interesting to see how we were able to resolve um, different uh, glycans attaching specifically to uh, one site and not the other, even though they're adjacent. Um, and here's the result from uh, the peptide mapping of the CD33 from Sinobiological. So again, it's highly glycosylated uh, with the same ident identifying glycans at the same six uh, end link glycosylation sites. Okay, and then we started comparing the different glycans found at each site between the two sample preps. Uh, and in general, we find um, fucosylated glycans are uh, more abundant on the CD33 prep from Sinobiological. And in general, uh, the glycan compositions do differ significantly from one protein to another, which may not be too surprising since they're from uh, different expression systems. And this was uh, just another different, the N100 n link glycosylation site. So again, we see the same thing, more uh, Foucault's groups within the glycans present on CD33 from, from uh, the HEC293 uh, cells. Whereas from R&D, we, we don't see as many Foucault's groups and in general, just uh, quite a few differences between glycan compositions. Uh, within Glycan Finder, we can also do positional profiling uh, or we can also display it as, this, as bar graphs. And so you can click on each site and either show them as percentages or as um, 
intensity values, relative intensity values, uh, which are derived from uh, the area under the curve of the precursor ion from each glycopeptide. And so from each of the six sites, I just highlighted the most abundant uh, glycan that was found. And this was used, uh, ultimately used to try and uh, match to the intact mass of the major glycoform. So again, I wanted to see if the uh, MS2 data, the most abundant glycans found in the MS2 data, would also match to an intact mass. Uh, oh yeah, here are the spectra from each of the most abundant glycans at each site. So we have a uh, fairly nice fragmentation of each of the peptides, uh, as well as uh, good glycan fragmentation ions uh, to support each. Okay, so yeah, I took the mass of each of the six most abundant glycans at each site. And when you add it to the, the average mass of the protein sequence, you can come up with a theor theoretical mass of uh, the major glycoform from uh, the bottom-up data. And uh, so here's our theoretical mass of 39,704.95. And the major, uh, sort of the base peak of the major glycoform that we measured was 39,704 Daltons. So this uh, just had an average mass difference between the theoretical and measured values of around one Dalton, which is uh, quite acceptable considering we're comparing average mass values. And uh, comparing the glycan ident identifications between the two samples, we found that 53% uh, of the glycans are shared, are found on uh, each, each of the CD33 preps. Uh, but between 23 and 24 percent are are different, and in total we found 209 unique glycans from CD33 uh, from R&D systems, and from the prep of Sinobiological, we, there were 207 unique glycans identified uh, across the six sites. Okay, so <clears throat> we. We've now begun to create some protein mixtures and test different enrichment procedures. Um, so obviously with a nice purified protein, it's fairly easy to identify these glycans, but what if we're dealing with the cell lysate or more complex mixtures? So uh, we first just started by mixing four antibody standards and testing our enrichment protocol with, with uh, protein standards. And uh, the best enrichment procedure that we've found so far is using this uh, mycocrystalline cellulose C18 uh, combined with C18 um, to enrich for glycopeptides. And here's the peptide mapping that has resulted from our initial tests. So as you can see here, this is just the flow through of anything that didn't bind to the MCC C18 column. And see, we only have one glycopeptide that had flown, had passed through um, the column. And most of the non glycopeptides uh, are found here. And after glycopeptide enrichment with this procedure, you can see we have. Uh, selectively enriched for glycopeptides that map to that conserved glycosylation site in each of the four uh, heavy chain, uh, IgG heavy chains. So next, we're uh, we're currently working with some yeast lysate and and trying to uh, selectively enrich for glycopeptides from full cell lysate. So in summary, our TimSoft method two performed best in identifying the most glycans that were also validated by the intact mass of our NIST standard. Glycan finder reveals extensive glycosylation at six different sites in CD33. And we can determine differences between 
um, CD33 expressed in HEC293 versus CHO cells. Uh, the most abundant glycoforms from MSMS -MS analysis also match to the most abundant glycoforms at the intact level. So at this point, we're um, as part of our like in profiling services, we're sticking with Timstoff method two, and obviously using our glycan finder software uh, to perform the analysis and generate reports. And uh, we're doing further testing with MCC and C18 uh, columns uh, to further improve enrichment of glycopeptides. 